yourselves to some coffee or tea? Or? Uh, well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to my dissertation defense. I'll take the next 10 to 12 minutes to quickly try and explain my, my research, um, which has been over a year, so there might be a few things that, that are harder to explain because I have such a short time. Uh, first of all, I um, have always been interested in why people do what they do. Um, and in particular, I'm interested in the work that people do. And the reason why is because I think that work can be uh, a source of uh, fulfillment and meaning in people's lives. Career practitioners often use an instrument called the self-directed search, which is used in career guidance to help match individuals to fitting occupations. And the self-directed search was developed by a man called John Holland. And it's based off of his theory of vocational choice and, and personality types. Now, in order for you to understand my research, I kind of have to give you a quick synopsis of Holland's theory and then talk about the SDS. Holland uh, believed that individuals could be generally categorized based on their resemblance to six personality types. Realistic, investigative, artistic, social, enterprising, and conventional. Now, he also believed that work environments could be based off of the, or typed using the, the same topology. Therefore, making a fitting choice is a simple process of matching one's personality type to the most congruent um, work environment. Now, over the years, there's been a lot of research to validate um, Holland's theory and, um, and to validate um, his instrument called the self-directed search. And based on that, that research, there have been guidelines that practitioners have been given to interpret self-directed search results. However, one such guideline, which is referred to as the rule of eight, has never been um, tested. Now, I'm gonna come back to the rule of eight in a second and explain where it came from, because most practitioners who use it actually don't probably know where it came from to begin with. So, uh, the, the self Holland created the self-directed search to help people identify their resemblance to each one of the reassect types, because we have a wee bit of each of those types within us, <clears throat> but we're predominantly more like one type than another. Now, the self-directed search provides two concurrent measures of an individual's personality type. The first section um, asks in individuals to list their occupational daydreams. So, for example, if somebody puts down, um, I most recently dreamt of being a counsellor, then I can look up that occupation in the Dictionary of Holland Occupational Titles, and that'll tell me that a counsellor is a predominantly social type occupation. So I have a measure of their expressed interest, and it's called expressed because they're actually in the process of, of writing it down, they're expressing it themselves. Now the second part of the self-directed search, which contains all the inventory questions themselves, and which is the main part, um, asks um, about individuals' likes and their dislikes, and activities, competencies, abilities, etc. Now at the end, they tally their scores and we organize the scores in descending order. So the very top score would be the reset type that you most um, closely resemble. Um, what we also do is we take the top three types and we refer to that as your three letter SDS summary code. And we have a, a little booklet called the Occupations Finder where we take that three letter summary code and we look up the occupations that most closely match your interests based on that code. Now, one of the, the problems here comes back to this idea of, of the rule of A. Um, every time you take an instrument like the self-directed search and you get scores, there's error in measurement. So for example, if you scored highest on social, and let's say you got 40 points, if you took the SDS three more times, sometimes you would score higher on social, and sometimes you would score lower. Those scores are known as your observed score, but your true score actually lies within a confidence interval. Because depending on the day that you take it, you might be feeling differently, and there might be some error in, in the questions, um, so there, there's basically error in, in all these measurements. And the reason why it's an issue is because we're trying to distinguish types from one another to determine what's your primary type. So for example, if you scored um, 40 on social and 36 on investigative, 
The standard error of measurement for the SDS is eight points. So that the four point differential between your highest and your second highest score falls within the standard error of measurement. Therefore, I can't say whether you're predominantly social or investigative. Now, while the, the standard error of measurement might be eight points, it's derived from a statistical formula. So it's statistically correct, but that doesn't necessarily mean it works in practice. So that's why people don't know where it really came from. And over time, it's just became gospel and known as the rule of eight, where it could actually be the rule of six, the rule of seven, the rule of nine, or more. So my research looked at, at the distinctiveness between the top two types and an individual's profile to determine when a difference really means a difference. So how did I do this? Well, I had a self-directed search data for 2,397 exploratory college fre uh, freshmen. And if you remember, what I have is two concurrent <coughs> measures of their personality type. The express type from the first page of the SES and the inventory type from the last page. So the other vital piece of information I have is I have the numerical difference between their highest um, SDS score and their second highest score. And that I refer to as primary code distinction, but from here on in I'll refer to it as distinction, so I don't have to use as many words. Um, so I have three vital pieces of information. And what I can do is group everybody by their level of distinction. So for example, if a hundred students only showed a one point level of distinction between their highest and their second highest scores, then they're really not that distinct. Now with that hundred, those 100 um, students, I can then match their expressed interest to their inventory interest and see whether or not they're congruent. Now what you would expect is that individuals, as, as distinction gets greater, an individual becomes more like one type than they do another, and the probability of their two concurrent interests being the same should increase. Now what Hall is saying based on the rule of eight is that the magic threshold is eight points. That's when you really will see, um, after which point you'll see a, a lot more um, percentage of congruence. So what I found when I analyzed the data is I did see, or I observed, a relationship between distinction and congruence between inventory and, and expressed interest. But just because you see uh, a linear relationship doesn't mean to say that it's significant. It could be, you could observe it by chance factors alone, or there could be other factors that would account for the relationship itself. So I ran something called a logistic regression, and that logistic regression allowed me to isolate the relative impact of distinction on congruence while controlling for other variables that theoretically could affect congruence. And what I found is that yes, the linear relationship that I observed was in fact significant, meaning that we cannot attribute it to chance factors alone, um, and secondly, the relationship is such that a one point increase in distinction leads to uh, an 8% increase in the likelihood of finding congruence between an individual's um, expressed and inventory interest. Now, the inferential statistics only tell you part of the story. A really big part of the story is, is, um, involves the descriptive statistics as well. And the descriptive statistics showed that on average, the primary core distinction for these 2,400 students was less than eight points, it was 7.35. Therefore, on average, we would not be able to distinguish any of these freshmen and say you're more like this type than any other type. Um, secondly, I took all the individuals who had a distinction score of less than eight points, because that's in Holland saying that they're, they're not distinct. And the average distinction score for that group was 3.9, which you would think is, is quite low. So when they score below 8 points, on average they score well below 8 points. So when they score at 3.9 points, that's kind of saying that it's very hard to distinguish between the primary type and the secondary type. However, when I looked at the level of congruence between the expressed interest and the inventory interest, 45% of the time, they match. Now when you take into context that overall, for all participants, the, um, the average level of congruence was 46%, then this suggests that, well maybe the rule of four could replace the rule of eight. So, 
um, I conclude by saying that my research casts doubt over the rule of A and suggests that while that rule of A might be statistically correct, it's practically conservative and that, in, um, in my opinion, the rule of A be replaced with a guideline of four and interpretative procedures for practitioners be updated to, um, to reflect my research. And that's by dissertation research. Thanks, Kevin, for your overview. Thanks. Dr. Kredovics.